Session again, Build and Control Act 2007. Members will recall that a recent uh, request from the Arctic Alliance to discuss with, their, with us their concerns regarding the regulation of Arctic as laid out under Part 3 of the Build and Control Act 2007. And I'm pleased to welcome the spokespersons uh, for the Arctic Alliance here today. I give a short presentation. Uh, Gary, Gary Solon, officer, Michael O'Neill, officer, uh, Brian Montat, spokesperson. I welcome also representatives from the Royal Institute of Arctics of Ireland, uh, Mr. John uh, Graby, uh, Registrar, Margaret O'Flanagan, Administrative uh, Mission Director, Catherine Megan, Assistant Director, and Tony Reedy, former RIAI President. And thank you for attending today. The format of a meeting will involve a brief presentation by you and your findings, following by a question and answer session. Before you begin, I'm obliged to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, you are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence you are to give to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence uh, connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that wh where possible you should not criticise make charges against any person or persons or entity by name in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Also, please note we will devote an hour to this item on our agenda, so you're asked to keep your presentations brief. Uh, would you like to begin? The Architects Alliance. The Architects uh, Alliance. Thank you. Chairman and members of the committee, Architects Alliance welcomes this opportunity to present the real concerns we have for our families and our futures. We are very grateful to the committee for scheduling this meeting at such short notice. I am spokesperson for Architects Alliance. My name is Brian Monteau. I have earned my living and been acknowledged as an architect in Ireland since 1983. With me is Gary Solon, who has been in business as an architect for 20 years with projects at home and abroad, and Michael O'Neill, a graduate architect also with over 20 years' working experience. I'm su subject to agreement with the Chair. I'm sharing time with Michael, who will address you after I've finished. Our membership and support comes from across the state. For example, there is Margaret Kerwin, who is here from Nina, Thomas McMenamin in Raffo, studying part-time for a UK MSc in architecture, Christoph Krieff, from Dublin, who already holds a master's degree in arts and architecture. Tom Byrne in Ennis, recipient of this year's Green Apple Conservation Award. And Liam Hazel from Skibbereen, who is here, in practice for over 32 years. Liam hopes that the act will be amended to include a great-grandfather clause, if the committee so um, desires. In addition, we are authorised to speak on behalf of the 50 members of the Galway Architects and Engineers Group, established in 1996 and whose standing should be unchallengeable. Traditionally, there have been several alternative routes towards becoming an architect. In Ireland, that diversity is about to end. But for now, it remains alive in our membership. We are all fervent about architecture. In our home communities, we are known as successful, competent architects, and we long ago satisfied the legal requirements for using that hard-won title. But today we are all similarly excluded, threatened with fines and imprisonment. Why? Because we do not meet new standards tailored to suit our competitors. <coughs> Unlike most of the Royal Architects, almost every one of our members is self-employed, and therefore no financial safety net is available from the state during periods of slack business. Consequently, last November's sustained Royal Radio campaign was inevitably and directly harmful to us. Only a few listeners will know that the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland later found the so-called public notice to be misleading and that an apology was subsequently broadcast by RTE. But the damage continues and cannot really be ended whilst the register remains prematurely open to public inquirers. 
The immediate problem is that the registration system is still not fully operational, even now, six months after the publication of the register. As it stands, we are excluded from the commercial benefits which Royal Architects receive through being named automatically in the statutory register of architects. The proposed registration fees have not been agreed, nor the exorbitant technical assessment charges. The alternative and permanent mature entry route, the PRAE, does not exist. The selected technical assessors are novices and can claim no competence. Complaints made against Royal Architects cannot be processed and are on hold. The road to regulation of the profession was paved in the 1997 Strategic Review of the Construction Industry, published by the Department of the Environment. A recommendation was made for protecting the titles of architect and quantity surveyor. The relevant part of clause 329 reads, albeit clumsily, the proposal should acknowledge the established right of those in practice without formal qualifications for many years via a grandfather clause. This vital prov provision was neglected in the BCA 2007 despite two attempts to int introduce a grandfather clause made during the guillotined readings of the bill. Instead, an uncertain and costly technical assessment procedure has been devised by our competitors, open to us only if we first prove that we're already long established market tested architects. It should be plain that the fundamental difficulty with the BCA 2007 can be remedied by the inclusion of a self-extinguishing grandfather clause, as is found in other legislation. This is not open-ended, our numbers are necessarily finite. The troublesome and irrational difference in academic standards set by the BCA 2007 and by the directive is also an easily made correction, provided only that vested interests are duly ignored. The statutory option of becoming a member of RIAI Limited, the institution, should be purged from the Act. We endorse the Competition Authority's recommendations for an independent registration body. In order to make this realisable, we support the creation of a single self-funding registration body for all construction professionals, whose responsibilities to consumers, after all, are alike. Closing the register until registration becomes fully operational, operational will stem the harm caused by its premature publication. Finally, in case the bringing of amendments on behalf of non-Royal Architects seems troublesome, do ask RII Limited whether it is true that it has been suppressing knowledge of its own essential amendment to the Act. In summary, there are many inherent faults in Part 3 of the Act and there is much to complain of in its implementation. Architects Alliance will, in the question period which follows, or at any other time, answer all supposed justifications for the non-inclusive aspects of registration. Correct the confusion of a technical assessment system with a grandfather clause. Offer a workable and transparent answer to the missing prescribed register admissions examination. Explain how the Act fails to protect against rogues and positively diminishes the rights of both consumers and architects. In conclusion, the private and elitist membership requirements of RIAI Limited, the institution, are now the law of the land. Together with government, it has, it has succeeded in creating a royal trinity where distinguishing between the supposedly separate parts, or should I say departments, is made uncertain. We have RIAI Limited, the institution, RIAI Limited, the registration body, and RIA Limited, the competent authority. At any difficult juncture, you will be told, it's not me, it's him. It's no wonder the Competition Authority warned of conflicts of interest. For, to, for today, you might test the explanations you will hear by considering, does this describe an inclusive or an exclusive approach? Who really benefits? Which of these three royal departments is actually addressing me? Last week, Architects Alliance asked the EU to investigate the gilding or gold plating of the directive, a directive that needed no new legislation for its complete transposition into Irish law. Thank you for hearing us today. And my colleague Michael is ready to speak, if that's permitted.
I call on Mr O'Neill and be as brief as you can because we have to hear from the Royal Institute of Architects yet. Yes, Chairman, I'm obliged. Chairman and members of the committee, distinguished guests, my name is Michael O'Neill and I'm a qualified architect of 20 years standing having qualified from Bolton Street DIT in 1990. I appear before you this afternoon to address the rights of graduate architects which have not been supported by the Building Control Act 2007. I understand that the Registrar's position is that one standard should be applied and that it should be MRIAI. To apply this standard universally, I believe, will be divisive, retrograde, and undermines existing established and statutory rights. It fails to adequately support the right to earn a living to which postgraduate and self-thought architects are entitled under Irish law. The basic standard that entitles Irish persons to call themselves architect under EU law is well known to the RIAI and is not that of MRIAI. Four kinds of persons were specifically referred to in the Architects' Directive DIR 85384EEC, two persons with qualifications and two persons affiliated to the RIAI, Diplark DIT, BRK NUI, AORIAI and MRIAI. This was written into the Architects Directive DR 85384 EEC and the Mutual Recognition of Qualifications Directive DIR 2005 EEC. Irish Statute SI 15 of 1989 transposed the Architects Directive into Irish law. The first two persons named, the holders of Diplark DIT and BRK NUI, set the bar at the level of graduate. These are people who have passed a full-time five-year course. Allow me to spell this out. Graduates are entitled to call themselves architect. The Building Control Act 2007 fails to acknowledge this. It adopts instead the standard of a private organisation. The Building Control Act 2007, and by implication the Registrar, is not working to the standards agreed with the EU. Who benefits from this? AORIAI is the associate affix, and this can include some non-qualified persons. MORIAI outranks AORIAI in the Institute, and the member affix also includes some non-qualified persons. So not only is the MORIAI standard not the right standard, their ranks are known to include unqualified persons as well. Yet, the RIAI Registrar on the Building Control Act 2007 fails to adequately recognise the rights of self-thought architects. Who benefits from this? DIR 2005 EC does not allow raising of the bar, it consolidates directives on the mutual recognition of qualifications. Within its well-worded provisions is a means of updating the course skills to cater for scientific and technical progress. This does not allow the Registrar to prevent natural persons with the required qualifications from accessing the profession. This process of raising the bar above the requirement of the EU directive is known as gold plating, and I have written about it to the EU. Who benefits from this? Are there questions to answer at government level? Yes. How was the government persuaded to ignore the rights of graduates to use the title and so fail to allow them to be automatically registered? How was the government persuaded to ignore the rights of established self-thought architects to use the title and so place their livelihoods and families' well-being at risk? A simple transposition of the persons named in the EU directive into the Act would have addressed the former and the insertion of a grandfather clause would have dealt with the latter issue. This was not done. Who benefits from this? These are the questions that have to be answered. Failing to answer them and provide the necessary remedies will leave many competent professionals disenfranchised. Thank you very much. I call on the Royal Institute of Art takes Ireland now to make their presentation and then we'll have a question and answer session. Yes. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. I've got to say something briefly about the RAI, where this came from, because I think that's relevant. Consumer protection and minimum standards, the EU context, and how the system will actually operate.